Okay, guys, I'm going to try to make this short and sweet, but there's just some kind of uh, must-know stuff there from uh, Chapter 10. So you guys did some exploring uh, what cities can do to try to make themselves more sustainable. Um, but there is some stuff from the text that I want to explore with you guys, and I thought it would be best to do in uh, this sort of lecture format, okay? Um, so we spent some time looking at this graph here uh, when I first introduced this chapter. Right. Um, and essentially, we're trying to determine whether that is a positive trend, positive in terms of uh, bringing us more to, to, toward a more sustainable future or uh, bringing us away from that. OK. Um, and really, again, it all comes down to, well, it just depends on how the city operates. How careful are they in terms of uh, the development that they're doing and so on? All right, uh, so first of all, urban populations, uh, generally speaking, are much more diverse than their uh, rural counterparts. So in terms of race, ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic status, languages spoken, all those things are much more diverse in our urban populations. Uh, the population tends to be younger, uh, which makes sense. Um, now, in our developing nations, so places like uh, India and most of Africa, right, the population in the cities tends to be a little bit more male dominant. Although, uh, in our developed nation countries, there tends to be more females. So, uh, dudes, if you're, if you're looking to, to find a female, you better go to the city. That's where you find them. All right. Um, now, some other terminology in urban agglomeration is referring to essentially where little townships or cities have grown together. Uh, so this shows all the urban agglomerations present in the U.S. Notice that most of California is just one giant urban agglomeration. Uh, so those 55 electoral votes come from uh, in the, the presidential election. So many people, uh, central Arizona, the whole I-5 corridor, in Washington and up through uh, north to central Oregon. Hey, they even have Lewiston and Clarkston in there. Look at that. Okay, uh, Spokane, Coeur d'Alene. So those are urban agglomerations, essentially an urbanized core region. Uh, several cities essentially have kind of grown together so they got this sort of uh, agglomeration of cities. All right, uh, 75 to 80% of North America lives in urban areas. So keep in mind that our developed countries uh, the vast majority of people live in cities. It's our developing world where that urbanization trend is really happening. Okay, um, when you go to the developing world, they're, um, again, they're having massive urbanization and they have not developed the infrastructure, et cetera, to cope with all those people. And so lots of people that live in our developing world uh, that are moving to the cities uh, live in substandard housing. They're often called squatters. So essentially a squatter is somebody who uh, illegal, uh, illegally occupies a space. Um, now, the police, for the most part, aren't going through and trying to clear out these squatters. They're just uh, it's land that is not managed. They don't have city services. So you can see in this photograph here, the ground is just littered with garbage uh, all over the place. Okay, so they don't have uh, toilets that flush and go to the sewer. So you, what you kind of have to try to imagine is in these slums, or what they're sometimes called favelas in South America, is, uh, you know, we've got a concentration of people, really, really high density population, nowhere for the, the human waste to go, nowhere for the solid waste to go, uh, no sewage system, no garbage collection system, no fire, no police protection. So... Uh, it, it's really kind of pretty horrible living conditions, but these people move to the cities just in some sort of hope of finding uh, a respite, some hope of finding some sort of employment so that they can increase their standard of living. Uh, so, you know, we talked back in Chapter 5 about carbon cycle. Um, so it is worth pointing out that, like, how urban systems do affect those biogeochemical cycles. Carbon still is going in and out of systems, uh, it's just going to look different. All right. So obviously, if we remove vegetation and plant material to build roads and buildings and parking lots, uh, there's going to be a uh, pretty significant decrease in photosynthesis. All right. So we have a decreased amount of carbon removed from the atmosphere. 
um, and no real carbon sequestration, no nothing holding on to carbon for long periods of time. And then, of course, we're going to have an increased output because we have uh, more concentrated use of vehicles, increased energy needs, more commuting from suburbs, and so on. Uh, so the way urban systems would affect the carbon cycle, generally it would be an increased output to the atmosphere. Um, now, when we look at uh, environmental problems of urban areas, again, we have to focus on what, what, how is the city going through its phase of development. So if we grow our urban area outward, which would be typical of most cities in the West, because most of those cities are new enough to be built after the, the onset of the personal automobile, uh, we're going to grow outward. So obviously, the obvious effect on wildlife is we're going to fragment it. Um, we're going to encroach on important wetlands, forests, and desert. Uh, some other environmental problems. This is uh, brownfields. You know, there's a good chance you see something about brownfields on the AP test. Uh, brownfields are, are uh, kind of abandoned areas, uh, usually residential or industrial, that might have been contaminated. So you kind of have soil uh, that's contaminated um, due to some industrial process or so on, and they just kind of are left vacant. So there's this sort of environmental hazards just sort of hanging out, taking up space. Uh, that's what a brownfield is, really common in uh, a lot of uh, Midwest, East Coast cities. Um, now, uh, because our surfaces are impermeable, so concrete, buildings, uh, asphalt roadways, and so on, um, a lot of the water that would normally percolate into the ground through soil, it stays at the surface and uh, becomes runoff. So we increase the amount of water staying at the surface after rainstorms. Uh, and that runoff, of course, can pick up motor oil and whatever else might be on the concrete and streets. So it's often contaminated. Um, but because less is able to percolate uh, or be absorbed by the ground, if it's a heavy rainstorm, it actually exacerbates flood conditions uh, in nearby surface waters. Um, now, when it comes to the materials uh, use in a city, uh, you know, the, the traditional system is is linear you know we get raw materials uh minerals what have you water from uh external environment the rural environment they're brought into the city used and then they go out as either waste or or goods and services to be shipped off to some other country or city or state or something like that um, and this is the system that we've identified uh as being primarily not sustainable so that the goal here is, you know, we are obviously going to have to bring some things into our system, right? And we're going to use those materials. So we're still going to have the system. But ideally, what would happen is rather than just going to landfills and being lost to the system, we want to try to cycle those back in some ways. So in some cases, that might be uh, composting things back down to good, healthy soil. And that goes back out to our rural areas. Or in some cases, that cycle might come right back to the city. Uh, some of these things we can reuse and not need to send back outside the city. Uh, and as much cycling as we can possibly do uh, helps with that waste management. But the more traditional system is to bring things in and send them away. And then bring more things in and send them away. Uh, and that's just not a sustainable cycle. Um, now, this starts to bring in one of the biggest environmental concerns with cities is this idea of what's called an urban sprawl all right so uh what happened around the 1950s is uh, people that lived in cities began wanting to live in uh sometimes they would say safer they actually and this is not meant as a racist but it's actually called this in academic circles they called it white flight uh, and so because our cities tend to have increased um, crime rates and increases in, uh, you know, uh, the safety concerns, more pollution and so on, uh, the more well-to-do people, and remember in the 1950s, that was primarily white people. It's not as much the case now. Uh, they just started moving out of the city into what's called suburbs. Um, and they called that white flight from our cities. People moved out to the suburbs so they could have bigger homes, bigger yards, less noise pollution, less air pollution, lower crime rates, 
uh, in many cases, better, safer schools and so on. Uh, and because of that, uh, people uh, were able to kind of live that American dream with a, with a house and a yard and a fence and a dog. Okay. Uh, but the result, uh, the, their employment remained inside the city. And so people were commuting into and out of cities longer distances. Um, and this still holds true today. Lots of people live in suburbs. Uh, and that leads to traffic congested streets because of these long commutes and the buildup of airborne emissions. Uh, noise pollution is a big issue. So, uh, construction and big heavy machinery and buses and, and people, uh, it actually, there's, there's, uh, increased stress levels with noise pollution, which has some detrimental health effects. Um, uh, and there's also this condition known as the urban heat island effect. Okay. Um, uh, and again, because of the nature of cities, there, uh, there's not as much vegetation. More solar energy tends to be absorbed by the surfaces, the buildings, the, the asphalt and the concrete and the parking lots. Uh, and if you compare the temperature of the urban area to the outlying, uh, suburban or rural areas, what we can see as much as a two to three to four degree difference in temperature as shown in this graph here. Right. So the urban heat island refers to the the kind of uh, unnatural rise in temperatures we see in our urban areas. OK. Uh, and then again, because we have a concentrated output of particulates and other air pollutants, uh, on certain conditions, we can get this buildup of a dust dome over a city, uh, which when the wind blows then carries those pollutants out to uh, uh, other line parts. So it's a big air quality issue and health issue, actually. Lots of health issues uh, associated with particulate pollution. Um, so if we look at the development of cities after the onset of personal automobiles um, and transportation systems, they cities have tended to grow outward. Whereas before, when people were really reliant on foot traffic and horse and buggy type systems, uh, cities remained extremely dense in kind of one core area. But after automobile and transportation became more common, those cities began to grow outward because it became easier and easier for people to, to move around and about. So you can kind of see what cities looked like throughout history uh, on the East Coast. Now, of course, our West Coast cities are much younger, and so they kind of started off in a more sprawled out way. So the urban sprawl, right, patchwork of vacant developed tracks around the edges of cities. So, again, that whole white flight thing we talked about. Now, uh, part of the reason people live in suburbs now, though, isn't as much about the crime rate as it is cost. Um, really expensive in cities like Seattle, uh, San Francisco, for example. Uh, they're kind of seeing the opposite problem. In, in the cities now, there's what's called gentrification. And what that means essentially is uh, cities are becoming more desirable to live in, kind of the opposite effect of the 50s. But what they're seeing is people who are much more well-to-do are now choosing to live in cities. Uh, and when they gentrify a neighborhood, that's referring to the process where they, they move in, they put in fancy like Pier 1 imports and pottery barns and cute little boutique coffee shops and stuff like that. And they, they spruce up these apartments and that causes the cost of living to skyrocket, uh, which is now driving lower income people out of the cities. And so they're kind of seeing a reverse of that. Um, not gentrification, um, is not really helping the urban sprawl just yet because people still, uh, are having trouble, uh, living in the city. It's just a different population of people now is what we're starting to see. Um, but, um, because of this urban sprawl, people are driving to work, from work. There are these long commutes, sometimes hours, and that's really, really affecting air quality and people's health because when people are on the road all the time, they tend to eat uh, poorly. Um, there was an FRQ just two years ago, actually, on uh, urban sprawl. We'll look at that in class here shortly. Uh, so the key to kind of avoid this urban sprawl and get people to actually live in the city, work in the city, uh, and so on. One of the key solutions there is this compact development that we talked about in class, but you also have to have mixed income housing. So within a single apartment building, uh, people of all income levels can potentially occupy that building because 
theoretically in our, our working system outside that apartment building, if, if everybody works in the same neighborhood, you can't have all, uh, you know, high income, white collar jobs in an area. You need the service sector. You need the transportation sector, people employed by that. Um, but if we really want to reduce the amount of travel and transportation, we need to make it so that they can all live in that same space. Uh, so gentrification isn't necessarily the, the key. It's, it's making it so that it's mixed income, that there's something there for all walks of life. All right. Uh, and so because of that, 11 states have now adopted growth management laws, or what they call smart growth, to try to make that happen. So that it's, the city is not just a place of really high crime rates and, and drug dealers, nor is it a, undergoing this gentrification process where the only people that can afford to live there are really, really high income people. They're trying to make it so that uh, anybody, uh, regardless of income, can live in a particular part of a city. Uh, it's mixed, it's diverse, um, and diverse systems, even if it's diverse people, are more resilient systems. And that is it for today.